how how do we do that? So Lee's going to talk about the process. This slide here. So you can see Richard has the book here, which is there's actually a wiki of this online now, so it's constantly being added to and constantly evolving at this point. Um, so <coughs> that's kind of some background, and now I'm going to talk to you about the exciting part, which is how this actually comes to be. So first, I'll just quickly tell you a little about a little bit about myself. I came to this um, in 2008 in one of my classes at SFU. I took a sustainable community development course there, and that's the first time I heard about this, and I was hooked right away. I didn't really know as much as I know now about it at that time, but basically. In my opinion, this is a very genius model because transition downs doesn't tell you what the solutions are. It's a, a, it's a framework that, that has a step-by-step -step process to mobilize a community into action, basically. And so it's completely solution, solutions-oriented. And so basically, this is kind of how it looks. It starts with initiator. So <laughs> the three of us and then the five of us, and then an initiating group gets formed. And so we would be kind of at this point, at that little red star on the left there, we're not even, a, there is no group yet, uh, which is tonight's kind of intention is at, when you leave today, if you want to sign up for the initial group, that's kind of what we're looking for at this point. And so the initiating group, the, the beauty of it is that it's only around for pretty much one year. It's the whole point of the initiating group is to raise awareness in the community to the point where you get to this, what's called the great unleashing. And then you release this movement to the community. So the steering committee is, only has one responsibility, which is public awareness raising, plus to learn about the transition. I'll get more into that after. But you can see that the initiating group goes into this unleashing, and then these other larger committees get formed in the community. And what this is actually about is about changing the governing structure of the community. Now I'll go to the next slide quickly first. So how this is different is it's like a string on a necklace. So basically those working groups after the, and after the one year education for the community to build critical mass, these other working groups get formed on transportation, heart and soul, education, currency, arts, recreation, health, energy, water, other communities have youth and families. These committees act as the official committees for, for the community and advise council on where we need to go. So if you're interested in food production, well then you would be on the food committee, connected to a larger image of, or a larger vision for the community. So right now, currently how most communities work is you have a movement or a group that works in one place and another group that works on this and another group that works on that and all of those things are siloed away from each other and this is about bringing it all in to a larger framework this is more of a facilitation process than it is about uh, you know some hierarchy telling you here's what you do every transition town and every community looks completely different than another because based on what that community needs. Like there's, in the prairies, they have tons of farmland. We don't have farmland here. <coughs> so our food production you know, conundrum would be different. But that's for the food committee to figure out. And so that's how this is really different. I'm going to come back to the process after. But I'm going to go through the steps here. So step one, form an initiating group, which is what we're here for tonight. And the design is demise from the outset. So. We don't want this group to be this hierarchy group. We want this to transform so that the community takes this over. So maybe there's 10 people on the committee from the beginning. By the time there's a great unleashing, there might be 100 people ready to be involved with any sort of committee connected to the larger transition process. So that group spends one year raising awareness. And here's some examples from other communities. And basically, you have documentary nights, you have uh, like on peak oil and why we need to change, that type of thing. We have panel discussions, you have some workshops that you do on 
you know, solar cookers, or just things to get people engaged with what transition is, and really teaching people what the process is, and so that more people, the awareness and critical mass is built in the community and starts kind of giving a beat to the community, and people start getting more like, oh, you know, something's going on here that's different. It's not just the same old thing. It's actually something bigger than something I'm imagining. The critical aspect of transition towns is the foundations. So the internal and external education is huge on this. So for people in the committee are going to need to learn about how transition works. So there's a lot of different readings. Permaculture, we're going to need to learn how to do facilitation so the group can operate at a high caliber. And then teaching the community why things need to change. There's a huge education component to this. and so. One of the plans is to have transition trainers come here and teach us training, which will be open to everybody, all the public, to come and learn. Uh, teaching facilitation, workshops, many different things that are going to happen over a year to really build a high caliber of coordination first before we actually unleash this. So that we have enough people in, who are more grounded in how to bring people together. So that it doesn't just flop on its face, which happens to many groups. Burnout is a huge thing that we don't want to happen here. So once there's this kind of critical mass being reached, and the, you know, it's time now to take this to the next level, you have this Great Unleashing. And so the Great Unleashing is basically this kind of, hey, here is this huge thing, it's time now for the whole community to take this over. And as you can see, a lot of people in different communities show up for these great unleashings, and one of the big things here, so there's kind of an example of a community doing their great unleashing, is this thing called, oh, well, I'll skip the six for a second, and then I'll go back to five. So this thing called open space technology, which is pretty much the most useful tool we could use as a community. It's a facilitation framework that can bring in 100 to over 2,000 people. And by the end of like a weekend, that 2,000 people can actually come up with a plan for the community. It's a very, very neat concept. And so in the Great Unleashing, we would use this open space technology, it's, there's a lot to learn about that as well, to bring that many people, like you can see at the bottom in, image there, like how do you bring in 1,000 people to say, okay, so what are we gonna do for a community? This is what we would use. And then the community starts to design its future together. And so step five is once we use that kind of tool, we form the working groups. So we have an arts group, food group, energy group, economics group. You have a, a one group that just does liaison with local government, a heart and soul group that teaches the psychology of change. You have a health and medicine group, housing group, education group, transportation group that are all connected in together so that they're not siloed away. So once these committees come together, then it's up to the committees to start making projects. And so what happens is basically the structure is one representative from each committee meets together. So there will be basically a transition group of like the food representative, the energy representative, the transportation rep representative. And this would be what they call the core group, who basically make sure that the flow is managed between all the groups and everything stays connected together. But these groups start making projects. So the food group might, like in Tottenham is what they did, is they planted basically nut trees all over the community so that 20 to 30 years from now, there's going to be so many nuts in Tottenham is that you can just pick them up off the ground and you can eat from anywhere. And so that's a visible, practical project that the community can see. And so that's what we start doing together when we do the unleashing, is we start making these projects that are all coordinated <clears throat> to a larger image. Like right now, a perfect example is My Mountain Co-op. That is transition, a community-governed mountain. But it's on its own, trying to make a difference on its own, and it's not connected into anything else. And so that's hard for that, to do that on its own. But if it has a network of support that's connected into this kind of larger community transformation process, then maybe it would see a little bit more success. So that's kind of the whole goal here, is you start getting these projects out, and the community starts getting more excited, and they actually start seeing change, 
and you actually have a couple hundred people that are really motivated, really engaged, like people that want to get up in the morning and going, yeah, I'm ready to go for my community today. Not, oh, I'm tired, I don't want to, I'm burnt out. Because that's what happens. And that's a huge difference about transition towns is that, you know, it's about getting more hands involved. So one of the things that people come together usually, the first thing that happens with the transition thing is this local food directory. So basically you make up the local food guide. And there's this huge myth in her group that we can't grow food here. And actually Kate Lyons did a uh, kind of survey for the council. They asked her to say, you know, could we get a green village here and what type of food could we grow? And there's actually a huge amount of options we can actually do here in Rupert between hydroponics and outdoor growing and to get our own kind of food production going here. Another thing is developing like a local currency that works alongside your, the actual currency. It's not about replacing it, but it's about keeping, I'm not gonna go too far into this, but there's a whole system to how this works and that's part of the education in the long run. But the economics group committee would figure out how this works. So it's not about you know me saying this is what needs to happen. It's about saying, well, let's bring them people in together and let's, they'll figure it out together. And that committee will figure it out. And then they'll connect into the rest of the groups and show us what's happening. So everyone knows what's going on. <coughs> My favorite part of this is once this is up and running, say over two years, we start this what's called the great reskilling. So we start hosting workshops all the time on different things to reskill our population. And so, not only just teaching about peak oil and things like that, but practical skills like jarring and canning and basket weaving and, you know, planting and, you know, how to set up a little micro hydro unit outside your house to power, you know, whatever. And basically, the whole goal is to get at least four average skills. It's every citizen in the community has to have four average skills so that if there is any sort of shortage or collapse or we're here to withstand something, Everybody at least has some sort of foundational skill so that you know your neighbor isn't completely out to lunch. They don't know what to do. We get the, the skill level up with the community. People are more skillful with different tasks so that when collapse happens, we're, we're prepared. And that, you know, everybody knows how to change a tire. Everybody knows how to do at least basic construction and things like that. So, I mean, this process is ultimately 10 years and never any really, but it's going to be 10 years to see this really come to full fruition. Step nine is once these committees get formed and things start happening, we build a bridge to local government and as it says, you may be pushing against an open door uh, because maybe the council will want this to happen. And so it's about cultivating a positive and productive relationship. And the, com the committees kind of facilitate the council on the community. And the council basically is acts as more as a facilitator. This really changes the governing structure of the community from a fundamental level. This is a huge undertaking. This isn't just the same old thing. This is something that's gonna potentially could take Grouper to a whole new caliber and and bring us international attention. People will come here to study the types of systems we set up. And so right now we have an official community plan, for example. But how many people really have the input on that? And is it an official plan that everybody agrees on? And are people, do even people know it exists? And so, well, okay, well, Honor engage the, and engage the elders. So a lot of this is connecting in with an older generation and bridging kind of the, well, they say that generational gaps are a myth, but bridging generational gaps and all of us working together because transition has no real definition. It's not something where people will be, go like that to. Any culture connect, can connect into transition. Any generation can connect into to transition. It's something that can, can unite us all without being political. It's a, it's a huge, useful tool. So this is where the plan comes in. So after a while, we create what's called the Energy Descent Action Plan. And this is a kind of visioning process for the community, and we would use open space technology to do this, but we would create a community plan together. 
And in these plans, you have transportation, waste, and water, and all that type of thing. But also, how does the youth engage with their community in 2030? What do they do? And then we make a timeline of what types of steps we're going to take together to get there. And we design that together. And you can get 2,000 people involved with this process. 2,000 people through a proper facilitation process. If 2,000 people had their input on this community, and we make it into a actual piece of paper plan, and some of the resources, I, if you got my email, in that zip file, there is a, an example plan that come from Kinsale, or Kinsale. So we create a plan, and then we just let it go where it wants to go. We don't attach to what this is going to look like. We trust the process. It's a, an unfolding process. We Basically, we can't really know where this is going to go. Nobody really knows what this is going to look like. We've never done this before. Nobody's really done this before. And other communities have, and we're learning from their mistakes, and they're saying this and that, oh, don't do that, but this works really well. And we kind of focus on what the right questions are, uh, rather than trying to say this is the answer. And we use the collection of the, of the community, and the community just kind of takes it over. And so that's kind of what the process looks like. And that's going to take a few years. And it's going to take that initial three steps of grounding in the proper facilitation and grounding ourselves in kind of the knowledge and the education of this be, before saying, okay, this is what we do. And that's why this is such a great process, because it's a slow, steady approach. So the ultimate goal, really, from transition is to start creating alternative systems alongside the systems we already have. It's not about saying no to the port and no to potash and no to things. It's about saying, you know what, there is this, who knows how much time left of peak oil. Some people say we have 50 to 75 years left. Who knows? But we start creating with the resources we already have now, alternative systems like food and energy and our own currency so that if anything happens, whether it's a mudslide or an earthquake or a tsunami or whatever, economic collapse, we have some sort of blanket of, of security here, of an already functioning inner kind of working of things. A community that's way more connected, a community that has festivals, and a community that has local food production that can potentially feed 20,000 people. This is about dreaming so much bigger than we've ever dreamed before. It's something that we can, I don't know, I think it's something we can really grab onto in this community, and I think it would bridge business, I think it would bridge so many different interests. I really don't think this would be a threat to any sort of uh, interest out there. It's something that's just so positive, it's, and it's just based in so much facilitation. You really can't go wrong with the process. And other communities, their process of doing this, they say, you know, at first some people go, I don't know about this, I don't know, I don't know. but after two years, it's like, oh yeah, who would have thought of transition? It just engulfs their community. It, it, you can't stop it once it started, basically. You just can't. Because transition is, we're always in transition, really. Okay, so, why we're here today. Um, we're here to start Transition Prince Rupert. A probably never-ending process that's going to define our community for a really long time. And everybody is invited to, invited to join Transition Prince Rupert. This is not an exclusive group at all. This is a 100% inclusive movement. There is opportunity for anyone to connect into this and anyone to get involved. And so, what we're, from what we've learned is that the steering group for this initiating group that starts this one-year process that eventually goes away is they need, that group needs to be kind of small, basically between, they say between five and eight, but you know, we're gonna, whoever wants to be involved, we're not gonna say no, you know, so if it's 15 people, it's 15 people, and we'll go with that. But we're gonna have kind of a network, this transition network, and we'll start having like monthly meetings come September 2011, because summertime is not really a good time to start something like this. And just connecting in. So part of the transition steering group's responsibilities will be to connect other groups that are already working on things that are about transition, or any group at all, and connect them in and start making partnerships. But we're basically inviting everybody to become part of Transition Prince Rupert. You might not want to be a part of the steering committee right away, but you might want to be a part of Transition and come to the events and come and learn about it and that type of thing. And you can already be involved with other groups and projects and things like that in the community and still be a part of Transition. 
And so, and also being part of it, you get access to all the formal education and training events, which is something that the committee will start setting up. Formal training on facilitation, formal training on transition, things like that. Anyone can come and register and be a part of those trainings. So anyone can join. So the steering group, which is today, which is what we want some people to want to be a part of this. So right now we're just presenting this. We didn't run with it. We, want, we gave people the opportunity to know about it first. The responsibilities are to guide the transition process in Prince Rupert for the next year and plan for its own demise. So the steering group is really going to be figuring out the nuts and bolts. You know, what type of things are we going to, why are we going to need to learn here? You know, who's going to have to be involved with this conversation? Which groups need to be connected in? What type of events need to be working? Because a lot of steering groups, what they do is they connect with another group, and that other group puts on an event as part of transition, but that steering group didn't actually organize the event. So it's not about the steering group making all these events about transition, it's about getting other groups on board as well to connect into it. And so start setting up transition trainings and public education events, connecting to other groups and organizations. And so we're thinking we'll have two meetings in June of 2011 just to talk about what type of readings we're gonna need to do and what type of resources are available and talk about how we're gonna start working together and then actually really start weekly meetings starting in September from the beginning. And so, continuing, so, like I said, the steering group might not be for everybody. It's kind of an intensive education process for that group. And we're gonna need to learn skill development on different things and facilitation skills. So we want the whole group to learn how to facilitate so that the group operates at a very high caliber and they're not victory in an argument with each other. And we're gonna kind of develop a curriculum first before we really start the process so that the group gets cohesion first. And that's something we think is unique about how we're gonna start this. And we're gonna have some transition trainers come up and teach us how to do this. And we're gonna learn about group process and governance and how that works. And we're all gonna learn that together. And we talked to some transition trainers from USA and they say that weekly is probably the best time to do this in the initial stages. So for the first few months, we'll probably be meeting, meeting weekly, like over a potluck meet type of thing. We'll, when we come together in June, we'll figure out what that's going to look like together. And yeah, plan on bringing, having workshops and things like that. So that's the steering group. The steering group is going to be responsible for learning and developing. And so you might not want to be a part of the group right away, and that's fine, but that doesn't mean you can't be a part of transition because after a year, that whole thing's gonna be unleashed and there's gonna be new working groups and more people can get involved and then the process gets a little bit more democratic. This is just figuring out the nuts and bolts. So, just to recap here. So there's the initiating group, which is about for me, networks and partnerships, awareness raising, gathering emails, getting more people participating, getting it kind of like what's this transition thing about, getting the community a little bit more motivated, creating the pulse. Plus, you know, if you're not a part of the committee, you're still you're still going to be a part of that. You know, there's no reason why you can't host a documentary night at your house as part of it. It's 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 so neat that way. And then, you know, maybe we'll do some reskilling events and workshops to, you know, just raise awareness around, you know, how to plant and things like that. And then we use the open space technology to do the unleashing to form the, the working groups on the different